Morning, everyone. My name is Mira Sivalingam. I'm one of the first year fellows here at Wills, and I'll be presenting our imaging conference this morning. So our first case is a 43-year-old male who presented to our clinic complaining of blurred vision for two months and was referred for a possible retinal tear in the right eye. Dr. Sh um, Dr. Light, would you mind starting us off? Sure. Uh, so here we have a uh, pseudo-color wide field image of the right eye. Vision is 2040. Um, starting right off the bat, I mean, the media appear quite hazy. Um, all of the fundus details are a little bit difficult to make out in detail as a result. Uh, it also looks like there may be even some focal floaters or opacities that are exhibited here with some of these shadowing artifacts. Uh, and then the disc itself is a little difficult to make out the borders, unclear if that's frank edema versus just obscuration from the uh, vitreous opacity. There is a, looks like a Weiss ring here uh, overlying the disc. Um, turning attention to the vasculature, um, I don't, uh, I don't see any prominent sheathing. Again, it's a little difficult to make out the temporal vasculature here, but otherwise they look to be of relatively normal course and caliber, at least out to the nasal periphery, though again, a little difficult to see them out here in the temporal periphery. Um, the macula itself, hazy view, but no uh, discrete uh, lesions or hemorrhages that I can make out here. And then turning attention uh, to the periphery, uh, attention is drawn to kind of the near to mid periphery where there are these very well circumscribed pigmentary lesions, some of which are uh, deeply hyperpigmented, um, and another lesion here which is, appears to be hypopigmented versus maybe even an area of retinal whitening here. Interestingly, this lesion here has this center sort of whitish core to it, unclear if that was elevated um, on clinical exam or not. Uh, and then the temporal periphery also shows this kind of diffuse, again, unclear pigmentary change versus frank retinal whitening uh, based on the quality of the image. Uh, but the nasal periphery looks relatively uh, normal, I'd say. Perfect. Yep. So on clinical exam, there was noted to be 2 plus um, vitreous cell. Um, and there was no disc edema on clinical exam, and there was a Weiss ring. These changes out in the periphery were more pigmentary changes and no frank retinal whitening. And pseudo color wide field image of the left eye, uh, similar visual acuity, 2040 again. Uh, in this eye, though, the media appears uh, clear, disc is sharp, about a 0.5 cup to disc ratio. Uh, where I can visualize the vasculature, it looks to be of normal course and caliber. The macula looks normal. Uh, the periphery uh, looks to have maybe some non specific pigmentary changes out in the far periphery again here, but no lesions and certainly no pigmented lesions like was seen in the other eye. And this is a wide field autofluorescence imaging of the right eye. Um, you can see that there's marked attenuation of the autofluorescence signal corresponding to the areas of hyperpigmentation. Uh, here's a little bit of hyper autofluorescence in the area of that pigment atrophy versus whitening that was seen on the uh, pseudo color image. Uh, of note, that kind of whitish uh, center core to this lesion actually does not appear on the uh, autofluorescent imaging. Uh, the remainder of the uh, autofluorescent pattern looks to be relatively normal. And in the left eye, I'd say, aside from maybe some nonspecific mild granular hyperautofluorescence out here nasally, this looks like a normal pattern of autofluorescence. Uh, here we have an OCT scan uh, through the macula of the right eye. Um, this is a horizontal raster. Um, it looks like on the infrared uh, onfos image, again, what may be some shadowing artifacts, maybe from vitreous opacity here. It doesn't look like a frank macular lesion. Uh, and then on the B scan itself, you can see this kind of hyper-reflective signal within the, the media, within the vitreous here, maybe a focal vitreous opacity, maybe possible clump of cell here. Uh, the inner and outer retinal lamination patterns uh, look actually relatively normal. And of note, uh, the choroid doesn't show any lesions or disruptions, but the signal is kind of attenuated. I wonder if that might be related to the media opacity overlying it. And then here in the left eye, again, a horizontal raster through the uh, fovea of the left macula here. Uh, no lesions on the uh, IR on FOSS. Um, in the left eye, you can clearly see the vitreous uh, has uh, much uh, more clear signal. 
Um, there is uh, evidence that the hyaloid is still attached here. Uh, and again, inner and outer retinal lamination patterns are normal, and the choroid looks to be of normal appearance without any focal defects. So just a brief summary of his anterior exam. Um, in the right eye, there was noted to be one plus anterior chamber cell um, and find KP inferiorly, and as noted before, two plus anterior vitreous cell. So Dr. Light, um, given the imaging findings, what etiologies are running through your mind in terms of a differential? Uh, we have a uh, 42, 43-year-old male uh, with a unilateral, what appears to be, I would call this probably a pan-uveitis, given all of the uh, posterior as well as anterior inflammatory findings. Um, you know, the differential, especially with those focal pigmented lesions in the retina, you know, I'd be thinking, and also possible retinal whitening, I'd be thinking about things like viral retinitis, toxoplasmosis as well, especially given the, the pigmentary changes. Um, also would want to consider syphilis and tuberculosis, especially if there are exposures uh, that we know about. Um, you know, other inflammatory conditions, uh, sarcoidosis, I think, would be on the differential. I didn't really see a whole lot of vasculitis, so I wouldn't be thinking about that quite as much. You know, other things, um, just to keep the differential broad as well, though, with these uh, really discrete pigmentary lesions, you could think about some sort of a you know, RPE hypertrophy, whether it's a chirpy lesion or something like that, but you wouldn't expect to see all this inflammation uh, with that. Um, and so I think, I think those inflammatory infectious conditions are the ones that I would uh, most want to uh, cover for. Maybe uh, histoplasmosis, too, I would also consider. Yep, so you hit on all the ones that are highest in our differential, um, given that old inactive choriretinal scar with kind of overlying botrytis and adjacent active lesion. Um, toxoplasmosis was higher in our differential. Um, when you see lesions like this with retinal whitening, you always want to think about viral retinitis and have a low threshold to get an AC tap. Just as you said, TB, syphilis, um, sarcoid. Bichette's possible, though. Dr. Polito, would you expect to see more um, involvement of the vasculature um, in Bichette's? Um, well, I guess early on it could be localized. Uh, and those truly were hyperpigmented lesions that he had out there? Yeah. Wouldn't expect that with Bichette's. With Bichette's. Either. Okay. So just a little bit about his past medical history. It was pretty, excuse me, pretty unremarkable. He was on no medications. He was a non-smoker, but I've known he was originally from Eastern Africa. So in terms of next steps, um, the patient was sent for an anterior chamber tap um, for viral PCR, HSV, VZV, CMV, and toxo. He did receive intravitreal clindamycin and was started on Bactrim for a presumed um, toxo infection. And this is a fundus photo of him a week later in follow-up. Rather similar findings, was noted to have persistent two plus vitreous cell, um, pretty stable appearance of this um, old retinal lesion and then adjacent act, more active lesion. There was no change in his AC or posterior inflammation. It was in vision, visual acuity was still 2040. So the AC tap actually did come back negative for all viral etiologies, and as we said, his symptoms were stable. Um, in terms of next steps, you know, we were thinking: Do we increase topical steroids? Do we give some type of localized steroid? Um, is it safe to go to PO steroids or intravitreal steroids? Um, we felt that you know this patient needs a little bit more of a laboratory workup. Um, given that the PCR was negative, so he was sent for a quant gold chest X-ray, syphilis, toxo serum antibodies, as well as basic lab workup, and was continued on topical pred and Bactrim. His laboratory results did come back with a positive quant gold serum antibodies for toxoplasmosis were negative for IgM, um, but positive for IgG. Um, Dr. Polito, what does the negative IgM versus and the positive IgG tell us in terms of is this an active or old infection? Um, so the IgM goes up after the uh, first two weeks of um, infection and then tapers down while the IgG goes up later. So the fact that the IgM is negative um, means that this is an old infection. 
I do like using IgG titers, though, and not just plus or minus, because if they're really elevated, that tells me this is probably a sub subacute infection. Um, but with all the pigmentary changes around it, this is probably a reactivation. Yep, so the titer was actually borderline high, so not, not rip roaring high. So given the positive quantiferon gold, we talked to the patient. He had no prior history of an active TB infection, but he was from an area that was endemic um, to TB. So this was treated actually as a um, reactivation of um, tuberculosis-associated uveitis. Um, the patient was um, started on ripe therapy. Um, I know Dr. Dunn is not here, but I can just talk about kind of our overall process in terms of when we do have presumed ocular involvement of tuberculosis. Here in Philadelphia, they actually are very good about initiating patients on ripe therapy itself. Um, so here in our clinic, we don't initiate that. We call the health department. Um, they have us fill out a couple forms and send in their records, and then they take it from there. So the patient was um, started on ripe therapy. So just a little bit of a ocular involvement of tuberculosis. TB is a mycobacterium. Um, it's an acid fast staining obligate anaerobe, which has a high affinity for oxygenated tissues, hence why um, they're predisposed to involving the apices of the lung as well as the choroid. So tubercular uveitis is rather rare, and it makes up between 0.2 and 10.5% of uveitis patients in all tertiary care centers. Um, it's obviously higher um, in patients who are immunocompromised and immigrants um, in the U.S. <clears throat> so it, TB can be either an active initial infection um, or a hypersensitivity to reactivation in the involved tissues. Um, and hematogenous spread of the, um, of the infection is thought to be responsible for uveitis involvement. Um, so this is a study, the COTS trial. Um, it was a retrospective multinational cohort study which combined data from 25 international eye care centers. Um, they examined a total of 945 patients diagnosed with tuberculosis-associated uveitis. Um, just looking at their overall systemic involvement, interestingly, 76% of patients reported no prior history of TB infection, um, and actually only about 16 to 70% of people reported pulmonary involvement. In terms of symptoms, 92% of people um, had no other symptoms of any active disease and other systemic um, symptoms such as weight loss, night sweats, and chronic cough were also relatively low. When you look at it, the overall distribution of where, um, where in the eye um, tuberculosis was affecting, people were affected most commonly as a posterior or pan uveitis as well as an intermediate uveitis. Um, anterior uveitis was a little bit less common. In terms of radiologic findings in these patients, about 27% of people had positive changes on the chest X-ray, but chest CT was more sensitive for showing prior um, evidence of um, prior infection. In terms of immunologic testing, looking at the tuberculosis skin test versus quantiferon gold, um, all three of these uh, tests showed high positivity in all these patients. So they decided that the gold standard um, to diagnosis was a culture-positive ocular fluid or acid fast bacilli on microscopy versus a positive PCR from ocular fluid. Um, now here at Jefferson, um, I don't believe we have access to PCR um, for TB. Dr. Polito, have you ever sent ocular PCR for tuberculosis? Because I don't believe we have it here at Jefferson that I've seen. Yeah, the other thing that you can do is 16S RNA PCR, um, and I've you know think that that would be good to have in our armamentarium, um, and I, I think it's it's worthwhile doing because I'm still so the the things against it's I'm still on the fence, mm -hmm. um, and it's one of those I wish I'd been there kind of situations um, because. What are the things that are for TB? Uh, the fact that there was a positive quantiferon is for P, um, TB, but that just tells you that there's TB somewhere. Now, 
the eye with the pigmentary changes um, at the level of the retinal pigment epithelium then and the retinitis, a retinochoroiditis, mm -hmm. which is what then he would have, is kind of rare for TB. It's, it's either, you know, an eels kind of thing mm -hmm. with a phlebitis and a choroiditis. So, you know, this is, this is a rare situation. While a retinochoroiditis from toxo mm -hmm. is pretty common. Now, you could argue against the toxo because the PCR for the toxo was negative, but it's negative in about a third of the cases. Mm -hmm. So, um, I think you did well because you've treated him for, for both and it's peripheral. And if it's the toxo between the clindamycin and the fact that it's peripheral, oh, and there's satellite lesions, mm -hmm. that really speaks to, to toxo. Um, so, uh, and again, the problem with the PCR for toxo is the tachyzoites, um, they, they stay pretty well clustered to the, um, to the back, so you don't get positive PCR in 36% of the cases. Would you expect a higher yield in positivity in the PCR with more active inflammation versus in the front of the eye, like a more robust anterior uveitis versus just posterior involvement? Or is there no correlation? Um, in toxoplasmosis? Mm -hmm. um, again, all I know are the broad range and um, the um, in the in the broad series, um, a positive um, PCR was only present um, in uh, 60 some odd percent of the cases of, uh, of toxoplas true toxoplasma retinochoroiditis. So this is just an image showing the different ways that um, tuberculosis associated posterior uveitis can manifest up here, we see an example of this serpiginous-like pattern um, versus this kind of larger confluent tuberculoma um, versus kind of these more multifocal lesions spread throughout the macula, or it can be unifocal, kind of um, these, what, the multifocal and the unifocal are rather similar to the um, lesions that we saw in our patient. This is just a consensus for situations um, where we should start anti-tuberculosis -tuber therapy. Um, just dividing it up into kind of the appearance of the lesions, the patient's history, and the positive testing. So they're saying here, if you have a serpiginous-like um, pattern of lesions in the retina, it doesn't really matter where they're from. If they have a, a positive skin test or an IGRA, um, which includes the quantifieron gold, um, you can treat for a presumed infection. If you have a more focal or multifocal lesion, it doesn't matter where they're from. If they have a positive skin test or an IGRA with chest X-ray or CT findings, you can presume um, that they have an infection and treat. And then if you have a tuberculoma, similar situation there. If they have any positive testing or any findings on their chest X-ray or chest CT, you can just presume and treat. For this patient, did you stop the Bactrim therapy for him? We did stop the Bactrim therapy. I mean, I, I, yeah. I'm a little concerned about that. I mean, this yeah. I mean, smells and looks like toxoplasmosis. If I had seen this patient in the clinic, uh, that's what I would yeah. presume and not order any ancillary testing. In this patient, you did pick up TB, which is great, but I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't think ripe therapy is, is treating toxoplasmosis or... It's not, yeah. Yeah. Correct. So has well, that... What would you so the treatment, it's, I believe it's still ongoing. So he came into our clinic in July, um, and then his positive quant gold came back two weeks later. Um, he wasn't getting better, so um, back, and Bactrim was stopped and ripe therapy was started. He came back, I have follow-up pictures, significant improvement and kind of inactivation of those lesions, improvement of the vitritis. Um, and he's actually continued on RIPE therapy. The um, Philadelphia Health Department actually kind of continues his treatment and monitors him. I don't see that wrong, as, as I said. And so he got the intravitreal clinda, mm -hmm. um, which was treated the, the toxo, and um, systemic bathroom for like two weeks. Yeah. So that, you know, could have also have been 
helpful um, in, in him. So, um, you know, I, 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 either way, you weren't sure, you treated both, and, and that's fine. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it, toxoplasmosis, inflammation, you don't you usually see like a clinical improvement within two to three weeks. Mm -hmm. I mean, I measure it by, is there a progression of the lesion? And mm -hmm. typically there's no if you start the therapy. The overlying inflammation and the maturing of the choreoretinitis can take weeks, literally weeks. Um, so I don't typically judge whether the Bactrim therapy is working just by, you know, how quiet does it look, because that can take a long time for things to settle down clinically. Sure. So if the lesion, if you are presuming this is toxo, if the lesion looks stable but the inflammation is persistent, do you consider more localized steroid or do you just treat them topically? I usually treat them topically. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, if you're confident that the, the, the infection area is localized and not growing, sometimes I do use um, you know, typically like Dorazol, like every four times a day to kind of calm down the anterior, and I think it helps with the posterior inflammation too. Yeah. And I think, you know, this was a unique situation in that the patient reported no prior infection. He wasn't treated previously for tuberculosis. So in these situations where they do have a positive quant gold and no prior treatment, um, we are inclined to treat um, just in case we're missing something. That was a Jared Herkheimer reaction is just a release of um, an increased um, inflammatory reaction to the um, release of, um, of the antigens um, from bacteria um, or um, parasites. So you're going to see that either way from TB or from the toxo, so that's not going to help you either yeah. way. Jose, there's a question coming up. OCT through the lesion, is that going to help the diagnosis that's from the audience? Uh, so OCT during an active lesion will help because, like I mentioned before, toxo tends to be a retinochoroiditis, um, while TB tends to be a chorioretinitis. Um, and the fact that um, we have now one post-treatment uh, that the retina is blasted out um, means that it probably is, uh, was a retinochoroiditis. Yes, yeah, so we have, here we have an OCT image through that old lesion. We do, though, see kind of involvement of the retina, so you can see dramatic thinning of the overlying retina. But as well, here in the choroid, kind of increased signal and disruption of the choroidal vessels as well. Um, so significant involvement of the retina in the choroid. So just skipping ahead, so this is a follow-up image two months after initiation of ripe therapy. He was noted to have significant improvement in the vitreous cell, um, much higher quality image looking at the posterior pole. Here we see um, somewhat of a regression of this active adjacent lesion supratemporally, and vision improved to 2025. Can Jose? I ask a question? Yep. What's the risk to the doctor in a patient who might have tuberculous uveitis? Yeah. And Dr. Polito, feel free to chime in. But in these situations, um, if we are presuming that there's no active pulmonary infection, there's no transmission of ocular disease to um, people around. So you don't have to put them on a negative pressure room. They don't have to be isolated because um, this is assumed that this is confined to the eye itself. That's a good question. Jose, what was the PCR that you recommended if you were concerned about TB? 15 sRNA PCR. And I kind of sent an email around a while ago, but. Like my other emails, they're kind of disregarded. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we'll move on to case number two. Uh, our second case is a 57-year-old female who was referred for sudden onset of blurred vision in the left eye for two days. Dr. Shalai. So we have a pseudocolor white field from this photo of the right eye. Central acuity is intact. The um, media appears clear. The disc appears to have a distinct and normal margins, the small cup, healthy rims, 
In regards to the retinal vasculature, they seem to have a normal course and caliber for the patient's age. Overall, the fundus does have a somewhat tessellated appearance to it. Uh, our attention is also drawn to this relative straightening of the vasculature just in the macula itself, and maybe a slightly blunted reflex here, but visual acuity is intact. There may be some early um, ERM changes. Same imaging modality of the left eye. This is the symptomatic eye. Acuity is decreased to 20 over 80. Our attention is drawn to vitreous opacities that we see here, mostly in the posterior pole. The periphery looks more clear. Given the coloration, I would suspect vitreous hemorrhage clinically in this patient. Uh, in addition to the vitreous opacity itself, there does appear to be this distinct kind of kidney-shaped lesion. Uh, hard to tell exactly the level, but it does look deep, and especially given the well-defined appearance, it might be subretinal, and given the color, it might also be hemorrhage as well. Difficult to really tell the disc and whether or not there is any disc edema there. And then in the visualized periphery, I don't really appreciate much in terms of intraretinal hemorrhage or uh, any evidence of a proliferative retinopathy, at least peripherally. So we have an EDI OCT going through the right fovea on the ONFOS infrared image. Uh, we do see that there are some changes consistent with an epiretinal membrane, these striations that we see mostly in the temporal retina, and they correspond to this ERM that we're seeing uh, on the B scan itself with some temporal thickening of the retina. Uh, the vitreous appears optically clear. The choroidal architecture appears normal. The thickness is normal as well. Uh, regarding the retinal laminations, we obviously have some temporal changes from the thickening from the ERM. Maybe a very tiny PED here as well. So, so also the um, outer nuclear layer is pulled temporally, right? Can you can you can you appreciate that? Um, go right to the in the fovea. See how it's pulled mm -hmm. out that way? Right here. Exactly. Um, so, um, what's the Stiles Crawford effect? Please enlighten <laughs> us, Dr. Polito. <laughs> So um, the Stiles Crawford effect is if the photoreceptors aren't um, parallel aligned to the light going in, then there's substantial metamorphopsia. And in this situation, because everything is tilted temporally, there's going to be a Stiles Crawford effect. So we have uh, the same imaging modality EDI through the left fovea. Uh, on the infrared image, we appreciate the um, media changes that we were seeing previously in the clinical photos. Um, on the B scan itself, the fovea appears to have a relatively normal contour here. Uh, the signal overall is attenuated because of the media opacity, but the choroid has a normal architecture and thickness, and the retinal laminations uh, appear normal on this side. We don't see any evidence of that ERM. So we have a 57-year-old female with a multi-layered hemorrhage. What's running through your mind in terms of a differential? Yeah, so with multi-layered hemorrhage, um, <clears throat> when we're dealing with something unilateral like this, I think of etiologies like um, Valsalva retinopathy. Uh, a RAM could do this, and then polypoidal could cause a multi-layered hemorrhage like this. Uh, when it's more bilateral or, or there's evidence of fellow eye involvement, things like Tursen syndrome come to mind, um, non-accidental trauma, uh, mostly in younger patients, though, though they could occur in older patients, and then leukemic retinopathy, although it's, uh, in this case it seems to be fairly unilateral. Excellent. Yeah, you hit on, on all the ones, given that kind of round, kidney-shaped, dark lesion, RAM was high on our differential. Um, obviously, you know, proliferative diabetic retinopathy can cause this, but her other eye was completely normal, so unlikely. Um, and then you hit on all the other ones we were thinking about. 
So just in terms of her past medical history, unremarkable. She was on no medications. She was originally from Albania. She denies any recent trauma, but does describe relatively strenuous exercise on her elliptical um, one day prior to onset of her symptoms. So we did send her for a basic laboratory workup, um, which was normal, normal A1C, CBC, and sickle cell screen. So I kind of want to pose this to the attendings in terms of our options. You know, obviously this is the first time we're seeing her. Um, if we're suspecting a RAM, do you typically observe these patients? Would you consider a Vastin? Would you take them to surgery for a PPV? What things are you considering in this situation? Usually I'll just watch. I mean, the only time with RAM that I'll intervene would be with laser if there's exudates. But other than that, we tend to watch these cases, follow with close B scans and make sure there's nothing else going on. But eventually they should go away if it's right. Yeah, only time you would consider surgery relatively soon if, if the RAM involvement of the hemorrhage component, typically the subretinal component hemorrhage is encroaching or has encroached the macula. And then obviously you would consider something like a pneumatic displacement. Excuse me. So, so to, uh, she was 57, 57, no mm -hmm. hypertension. Yeah. So, so there's a lot of things that, that make me think, whoa, I, I, I'm, RAM in this age group is not normal. In this mm -hmm. series from RAB, the average age of the patient was, I think, 67. And this is, you know, ten, a decade younger than that. Um, and so, um, you know, don't just put RAM out there without a lot of little asterisks. And they all had hypertension too. So this is pretty young for um, and a non-hypertensive young person with, uh, with RAM. That's not common. Yeah. I would I would probably agree with uh, observation as well until it declares itself. I don't I'm not convinced this is a RAM either. This could just be Valsalva. Um, you know, it's nasal, it's not in the macula. So uh, I think observation makes sense. And also blood pressure. Normal. We did check that in the office. Um, and we did send her for that laboratory workup as well as a systemic workup with her primary care doctor. Um, and we got a lipid panel as well, which was normal because there is some associations with um, RAM and hyperlipidemia as well as hypertension. Linking these two cases together, I think the, the overarching theme is, is that the clinical exam is, is of paramount. You know, you can look at blood work, you can look at all sorts of other things, but the, the clinical exam is what guides this, this specialty especially. So yeah. uh, I think the clinical exam is very important. Yeah. So we, we opted to observe she came back 10 days later. Vision was down to count fingers. Um, Dr. Shalai, do you want to walk us through what we see here or what we don't see? So we have a pseudo-color white field on this photo of the affected eye. Uh, compared to the previous imaging that we saw, there is interval worsening of the medial opacity that we see. Uh, specifically, our attention is drawn to this central area of what appears to be vitreous hemorrhage. But compared to the previous uh, imaging that we had appears to be slightly dehemoglobinized at this point. It's hard to really appreciate what we thought was that subretinal lesion there, just uh, given both the medial opacity and the lid artifact here, but overall interval worsening um, of the vitreous component. A B scan would be useful too, just to see where, you know, what's going on. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So the patient was a um, high-functioning professional, um, was very bothered by her vision. Um, first, we have a couple um, images. Dr. Shalai, would you mind walking us through this? Yeah, white field fluorescein angiogram of the right eye at 23 seconds. Looks like we're just past the laminar flow phase at this point. Um, our attention is drawn to that dragging that we were appreciating on the clinical photos here but no abnormal uh, fluorescence patterns uh, as appreciated at this time point. Um, no disc uh, hyperfluorescence either. Uh, later image, uh, we're past the AV phase at this point. Again, we don't appreciate any abnormal fl fluorescence patterns. Uh, same imaging modality in the left eye. We're at a, at a late frame right now. Um, 
obviously there's a lot of obscuration from uh, blockage from the media opacity here. We get a tiny glimpse of what appears to be the disk. Mm -hmm. I'm not 100% sure, but it uh, doesn't appear to have any uh, obvious leakage. So as I was saying, you know, the patient was very, very bothered by her vision. She was a high functioning professional um, and wanted something done about the vision. Um, you know, in this situation, attending, you know, she's, it's 10 days out. She's very bothered by her vision. Would you offer her vitrectomy? Would you consider an injection to see if it's gonna help or would you just continue to make her wait? She fake it? She's fake it. Yeah. I mean, I I, I would talk to her about this at, at length. Um, you know, observation, I'd probably push for it. If she's really interested, anti-VEGF is not um, uncommon in the setting of a RAM. I don't think it necessarily helps much with Valsalva. Um, so the etiology is a little unknown, so that's the kind of the issue. Yeah. A vitrectomy would be the last option. So without the etiology, would you just inject anti-VEGF? I mean, we don't really know. Yeah. So. Well, she's getting better. The blood is dehemoglobinizing, mm -hmm. and I mean, as as all hemorrhages do, they disperse and they have a, a decrease in vision as they go through that yeah. foggy phase. So, yeah. I would try to convince her that you know you're getting better. Let's wait it out. Yeah. A B scan will be very helpful if you want to think about surgery because you can also figure out what the the vitreous status is. You can't presume there's a PVD here. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think if you pursue a vitrectomy, they get a cataract, and now she's got to get a cataract surgery and she loses her presbyopia or she becomes presbyopic in that eye. That's, she may complain about that too. So uh, you're going to have to look at the big picture. Yeah. So after extensive discussion with the patient, um, we did opt for surgery. <laughs> Mary, just let me say that you can always talk a patient out of surgery. Yeah. <laughs> if I didn't want to operate, I'd say, look, you can wait, it will probably get better, or you can have surgery. And, they all say, and then they all, no thank you, Dr. Benson. Um, so she did undergo a pars plane of vitrectomy for non-clearing vitreous hemorrhage. Oh, <laughs> so this was her fundus appearance one week after surgery. Dr. Shalai, would you mind walking us through what you see oh. here? Uh, interval improvement of the vitreous opacities here. Um, media is clear uh, and our attention is drawn to the same kind of kidney-shaped uh, subretinal area that um, we were suspicious for a hemorrhage. At this point, it seems more organized and dehemoglobinized. And um, along the, seems to be an artery here, uh, there does seem to be some focal spots of possible fibrosis. Yeah. So looks like a RAM. We have our diagnosis. We were kind of suspecting it the entire time. Um, question for the attendings, you know, you go in, you do the vitrectomy, you clear out the vitreous hemorrhage, you see this lesion. Um, obviously, it's not in the macula. Lesions that are closer to the macula, um, would you consider pneumatic displacement or TPA? Dr. Gupta, you're shaking your head. No, yeah. not, definitely not in this scenario. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Only if it's under the macula and the, the hemorrhage is very thick, then you'll consider it. But in a peripheral lesion like this, just leave it alone. This is, you know, this is, this is going to be hard to get out. I mean, this is not, TPA is not going to work very well for this. Yeah. Where, where is the RAM? I can't see it on this picture. So it's kind of hidden by the dense subretinal hemorrhage, but the thought is that it's hiding under this dehemoglobinized area. I can right see here. the blood vessels. I don't see a RAM. Yeah. Yeah. I think the suspicion that it was right up here. Uh, Fluorescein will give you the answer. Oh, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. So let's start from 7 o'clock. That's a vein. Uh, go down. That's No, go up a little bit. That's a vein. Mm -hmm. Next one's an artery. So go up. Go. That's an artery. Mm -hmm. So the next one's got to be a vein. So it can't be along that one. can't be that. So it's got to be that one. And I, right here. I, 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 oh, I don't see it. And, and the, the other eye was pristine, you know? Really so, yeah. so the it other could, eye had no crossing changes nothing. on the floor scene. So I guess it could be, and I guess she doesn't follow the normal rules, but something's happening here, and it, I am not sure what it is yet. <laughs> Would ICG be helpful? I mean, I'd do an angiogram if you really want to know where this stop. RAM is, if there is RAM. 
So just briefly, because for time's sake, a little bit about retinal macroaneurysms, there's thought to be focal dilations of the retinal arterial branches. They typically occur within second order arterials. Um, like Dr. Shields alluded, alluded to, it's typically at the arterial bifurcations or AV crossings, and they're typically found in the supratemporal retina. Um, they're most common, like Dr. Polito pointed out, in the sixth or seventh decade of life and more commonly associated with patients with hypertension, hyperlipidemia, or um, lipoprotein abnormalities. Fitch et al. in 1978 described the histopathology, um, and he found that there was vessel wall thickening, presence of fibrin and foamy macrophages. Um, and the outpouching of the um, vessel wall is thought to be related to localized ischemia, ischemia, secondary to focal embolic damage, and lipoprotein damage to the arterial walls. Um, these are just some nice histopathology images showing these foamy macrophages in the wall of the arterioles. And here you can see kind of lipid deposition um, in the wall of the arterioles near adjacent to the presence of the macroaneurysm at the bifurcation. Vision loss in these situations is typically from macular edema, vitreous hemorrhage, subretinal hemorrhage. Um, like Dr. Civilian was alluding to, hard exudates can also affect the vision. Um, and in rare cases, serous retinal detachments. This was a prospective, non-randomized study looking at 37 patients with RAM found to have visual um, decline secondary to either exudative and or hemorrhagic manifestations involving the fovea with vision of 20, 40, or worse. Um, and they were treated with three Q4 a week injections of bevacizumab and they did find, not surprisingly, that the visual acuity improved. The question here is, you know, the typical course in these situations with a RAM is they self-involute. The vitreous hemorrhage um, improves on its own. So is this secondary to the bevacizumab? Is this just the natural history and we're just treating with a vast and unclear because they didn't have a control um, arm? So here's the appearance of her fundus at post-op month one. She was complaining of a supertemporal curtain um, in her vision, kind of corresponding to the location of this. But here we can see that this lesion is um, kind of retracting. You can see the line here kind of retracting in with all the dehemoglobinized um, blood. Um, so we're observing. Um, she's dealing with the, the curtain. Um, you know, in your experience at tendings, do you ever see kind of re-bleeds if we are assuming that this is a RAM, or do they typically involute and stay quiescent? Usually it's, you know, it becomes quiescent. I don't think it reactively bleeds as, um, repeatedly. Sometimes you can have multifocal macroaneurysms. One bleeds, retracts, and then another one can bleed. But those cases, their blood pressure is uncontrolled. Uh, I'm still puzzled by this case because, you know, as Jose said, there's no, the other eye is normal, this eye is atypical. Uh, Jose, how about posterior polypoidal? Could that be? Yeah, I, I was thinking something like that. It's the left eye. She didn't have any trauma to the eye either. Okay. So P, I, I like your idea of possibly PCV. It, you, know, it, um, you know, those that can bleed as well. I think an ICG would be very helpful. Do we think that small PED in that right eye was anything? Uh, you saw something I didn't. That was good. <laughs> Maybe when the next time she comes, do a FA ICG and see what it shows. It does have some packy vessels, some large vessels. The thickness is pretty normal, though. Yeah, it's not very but, thick. But, yeah. Excellent. Um, 7.30, do you want to may go to the next case, or should we? Great discussion on the cases. Yeah, superb, superb case. Yeah, okay. Thank you, everyone.